Hello, everyone, clinicians. This is Ali Nessa, and I'm joined today with our own faculty, Dr. Jerry Simmerman, the program director of the AGD program, residency program at Stony Brook University School of Dental Medicine, who has co authored a, uh, a wonderful article in this month's Journal of Endodontics titled uh, Revitalization of Undeveloped Teeth with Apical Periodontitis Using a Collagen Hydroxyapatite Scaffold. And uh, this article is, um, is going to be published in this month's Journal of Endodontics. I encourage you to read it. But he's been kind enough to share a little bit of time with us to discuss uh, this article. Jerry, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Terrific. This article you co-wrote with Dr. Alan Nevins, and it talks about four specific cases where you have used this collagen scaffolding that you have developed in order to aid your revascularization of um, non vial teeth with incomplete uh, root formation. Can you please, uh, first of all, for those viewers who may not be uh, familiar with the concept of revascularization, just give us a little bit of a brief overview of what is revascularization or revitalization in endodontic therapy? Well, uh, re revitalization is the inherent potential of tissue uh, to pro proliferate into the necrotic pulp space of an immature tooth. And what we're trying to do is get the pulp to essentially regenerate. And there's a lot of research going on in endodontics uh, to try to get that to happen. Uh, currently, there's a protocol uh, that the American Association of Endodontists have in treating uh, non-vital open apex teeth uh, with the goal of trying to get regeneration of the pulp. And we followed this protocol, but we added a scaffold to the protocol to try to make it more predictable. Uh, in the past, when we got a non-vital open apex tooth, the way we would treat it, we would put calcium hydroxide in the canal and hope to get an apical barrier at the apex and then fill uh, gutta percha filling against this apical barrier. But the downside of this technique is it still leaves the walls of the tooth thin and you don't get any uh, growth of the apex or any root lengthening. So what we're trying to accomplish is to get some root lengthening and thickening of the walls to the tooth of the tooth to prevent fracture. Uh, an improvement upon that te technique was to use a, a one-step MTA or BC putty bioceramic technique where you put a plug at the apex and then backfill with gutta percha, but it had the same downside of leaving the roots thin. So the goal was really to find a way of uh, treating these teeth and continuing uh, root growth in a non-vital situation. So we did uh, four cases uh, in, in this paper, and I'll, I'll go over one in detail and another one in less detail and just show you how this worked out. Uh, in the first case, we had a 14-year-old female was referred for evaluation of tooth number 13 by her orthodontist and general dentist. And she was asymptomatic, but she had a carious exposure in tooth number 13, which re resulted in a non-vital pulp. And uh, the root, root stopped growing at that point. Uh, electric pulp test was negative. It was uh, not sensitive to cold. We knew the tooth was non-vital. So here you see the x-ray on the left. And there's a, a wide canal with an open apex. And in this case, what we wanted to do is get the apex to close and maybe get some root lengthening. Uh, so we, we also did some cone beam computer tomography to analyze the size of the open apex. And we found that the apex was actually 1.5 millimeters in diameter, which would be equivalent to a file that's 150 files. That's a pretty open apex tooth. And our pulpal diagnosis uh, was pulpal necrosis, and the periapical diagnosis was asymptomatic apical periodontitis. We gave the patient's parents and the patient several options. One was to do apexification using uh, bioceramic material at the apex and backfilling with gutta percha, which is kind of the standard te technique prior to regenerative therapy. Or the other option was to try to do a regenerative endodontic treatment. Uh, the parents decided they wanted to try our regenerative endodontic therapy to try to get the apex to close and to get root lengthening and a stronger tooth. So uh, the technique that's described on the American Association of Endodontists website uh, protocol is that you first start out by debriding the canal with endodontic files gently. You don't want to put rotary files in there and instrument a lot because the walls are pretty thin. The first file we got in there was a size 70 file and it fit pretty loose. And the canal was instrumented and irrigated with 6% sodium hypochlorite, 10 milliliters, using an endovac. We used the endovac to try to prevent extrusion of the sodium hypochlorite. And we dried the canal with paper points. 
And then we put a cream-like consistency mixture of ciprofloxin and metronidazole in the canal mis mixed in equal amounts in saline. Um, we used to use minocycline, but we found that this turns the tooth a very dark shade of gray, and the tooth cannot be bleached after that. Then a cavit filling was placed into the axis opening. The patient returned in one month. And at that point, we went back into the tooth and we used a buccal infiltration of uh, 1.7 mLs of mepivacaine. The reason we use the mepivacaine is you don't want to use epinephrine because that shuts down the blood supply to the tooth. The tooth was reopened and irrigated with 17% EDTA, 20 mLs, and we dried it with paper points. And then we took an endodontic file past the apex and instrumented to try to get bleeding into the canal. Okay. After there was an adequate amount of blood in the canal, you can see the blood coming into the canal up to the CEJ. We then took a material called Sinas Putty, which is a uh, collagen hydroxyapatite implant material that's normally used in, in, bone, in bone grafting and with implants. And we took some of the Sinas material, we cut it into pieces and soaked it in saline, and we packed it into the canal with vertical pluggers, and we overfilled the canal and tried to push some of the material into the cervical periapical area. VC putty was then placed over the synos, and a uh, saline moistened cotton pellet was then placed over the BC putty to allow the BC putty to set, and then cavit was used to cover the cotton. Initially, we used MTA, but found that the MTA also stained the teeth, and it's not an issue with posterior teeth, but in anterior teeth, you don't really want to use MTA in the, in the crown or the cervical area because you'll get a, a gray stained tooth, which you can't bleach. And then Cabot was used to cover the cotton. The patient returned a couple of days later when we placed a composite in the tube. Uh, here are some of the x-rays. This is our pre-op with the open apex. Uh, here's a film that shows the Hedstrom file in the canal. And this is the Synos placement. So the Synos is placed into the canal through the apex. This is BC putty here. And this is composite on top of it. We had the patient come back in six months and one year. And you, if you look at the one-year recall, you can see the BC putty in here, and the entire canal is calcified uh, just to about the apical third. And if you look at the apex of the tooth, you've got some root elongation here and apical closure. And this patient is essentially done uh, with this case. Jerry, for those people who don't have a um, familiarity with the Sinos putty, can you tell us about this, uh, the collagen matrix that you have in terms of its consistency? Is that, is that more of a spongy form? Is it kind of like collar coat? Is it more like gel foam? What kind of consistency does it have? It's not, it, collar coat is kind of is soft. This material has almost like a fiberglass consistency to it. I guess the hydroxyapatite makes the collagen hard. And uh, this is an interesting technique. Because when I was a resident 30 years ago, Dr. Nevins had, had done several case reports using this material uh, or a precursor of this material, which was very successful. And then it kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. And now that there's a lot of research going on on this topic, uh, there's actually, this is a commercially available uh, material that was very similar to what he did in his original case reports 30 years ago. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a little tricky to place it, but you can cut it into strips, and it's almost like doing a shoulder technique for filling a canal with three millimeter sections of the material using vertical pluggers. Okay, and here's a cone beam, and you can see uh, in the first view here, this is a sagittal view, and you can see the calcification in the canal. And when this is blown up, you see actually little openings in the calcification, which probably are blood vessels, and you, the canal is typically open at the bottom. And here's a coronal view, and you see pretty much the same thing. These are axial views. This is the coronal third. You can see the canal is closed. And uh, if you look at this view in the middle third, you see the calcification uh, in the canal, but you also see like almost what looks like a periodontal ligament space around the calcification and then the rest of the tooth. And this is pretty typical. And in the apical third, you see that the, uh, there is a uh, you know, tissue in the apical third. We don't really know what this tissue is yet. What really needs to be done is some animal studies where they use this technique and, um, and uh, section it and see what's in there. Uh, Dr. Torbinajet had done uh, uh, animal studies using uh, uh, blood in the canal or, or plasma, and he sectioned it. And we're, we're hoping that somebody, you know, I, I know somebody's going to do a study using this material. It's in the works right now uh, to see what's actually in there, and that would be very helpful. 
So do you think that it would be fully re remodeled and replaced, or does some of it remain? I would obviously I would assume that it would be fully remodeled, correct? I, I think the uh, the the material disappears and it's it's remodeled. You know, just like if you were doing a you know a, a bone graft or you know using some sort of material that acts as a matrix for the bone to grow in. And this is just a, a an enlarged view of the, the axial views, and you can see how um, you know it, it's closed up. Okay, I'll show one more case, but I won't describe it in detail. This was kind of interesting because we've been trying these on retreatment cases, which is a little unusual. And um, if you look at the pre-op x-ray, in this case, this patient had these teeth treated when she was uh, 10 years old. Now she's 40. So you've had a non-vital case here with periapical radiolucencies that's been like this for 30 years, probably. A pretty entrenched infection in the tooth. And she came in swollen. So we opened those teeth up, we cleaned them out, and uh, we used the same technique. And uh, I'll just show you what happened here. This is the pre-op, and you can see this was like almost a pulpotomy material that they did. And there were huge lesions at the end of these roots. And in our article, we have cone beams of all of these, so you can see them. And, and this is the synos placement. After treating it with the antibiotic paste, we leave it in for a month, we go back in, and over instrument the canals, and we get bleeding into the canals, and we place the synos, the collagen hydroxyapatite, and leave it in there, and we follow it, you know, periodically. And then at the six-month post-op and the one-year post-op, you can see this is the one-year post-op. This is the pre-op here, and you can see, uh, you know, radio opacity in, almost in the entire canal and these lesions have healed. If you, ref if you go to the article, we have pre-op cone beams and also one-year cone beams, and you can see in detail how these lesions have healed up. So this even worked in some retreatment cases as well, which is very unusual. It's actually incredible. It's a testament of your ability to clean and shape and disinfect that root, despite right. the fact that it's been retreated, uh, this, it's been treated and infected for such a long time. Right, so, uh, you know, again, Typically, uh, you know, these teeth would be extracted and maybe implants would be placed. I saw the patient for a two-year follow-up. The, the general dentist is going to place new crowns on these teeth now and just, uh, you know, either uh, just do core buildups. This is uh, just some CBCT images preoperatively at one year of tooth number eight. And you can see here uh, the size of this lesion here. And this is the kind of tooth, if you look at on a comb beam, that, you know, you might decide to extract it. Huge open apex here. It's about two millimeters, large lesion. And this is the one-year follow-up. And look at that bone regeneration there. It's pretty good. And right above the root here, and you can see the calcification in the canal. And the typical last three millimeters uh, has tissue in it, most likely. We don't know exactly what it is at this point until we do further research. But this is a very nice result for a retreatment case. So this is tooth number eight in that case. And here's just a, a close-up of that on the right. You see this calcified material in the tooth, and it, it's not uh, solid. It, there's, it's, it's kind of heterogeneous, and it, you know, maybe some blood vessels coursing through there. But again, you know, we need to do some histological studies to document that. And this was tooth number nine. And this is the pre-op here. You can see this large lesion here, open apex. This was that paste that was in the canal. And this is a one-year follow-up. It's calcifying here at the top, and you can see the apex is actually closing in this case. And, you know, in the past, I would look at these cases, and they would look like hopeless cases to me, and I would refer the patient for implants. But now I think, you know, hopefully we can save more teeth. This is the, uh, the, uh, sat, uh, the uh, axial views, and this is the coronal area, which is calcified, the middle third, and then you can see the apical third here. There's tissue in there as well. Some close-up views there. So, uh, in conclusion, the technique of adding the synos putty collagen hydroxyapatite scaffold to the existing revitalization protocol uh, uh, has been described in this article, and we got substantial heart tissue repair. Uh, this result may leave teeth more fully developed and less likely to fracture, and that's what we're hoping for. I think revascularization and uh, revitalization is a very exciting and interesting uh, um, component of endodontic therapy, modern endodontic therapy. I think our understanding of the importance of proper cleaning and disinfection um, 
is kind of making us go back to the old axiom that our job really is to remove the irritants and then let healing take place on its own. And it just goes to show that, you know, we don't really always have to have gutta percha and sealer as long as you are completely disinfected and eradicated any bacteria from inside the root. It's possible to get revascularization in these larger canal orifices where the body has the ability to uh, revascularize this area. So this is a very exciting and interesting um, uh, article. And this, this, this four cases that you've done, I've already had a chance to read the article and pre-publication. It's, it's wonderful. I'd like to congratulate both you and Dr. Nevins on this great work that you have done and now sharing it with our colleagues. And for those interested in uh, seeing all four cases, they should uh, look at the Journal of Endodontics, uh, June 2015 article where all these four cases are showcased and the entire technique is explained. This obviously is, is, a, is a fairly um, uh, technique driven uh, and very uh, precise kind of work. It's done primarily by endodontists and using the microscope would be very helpful in terms of being able to see what you're doing, especially with application of the, and the position of this collagen matrix that you're talking about, Jerry. So um, once again, thanks so much for joining uh, me and sharing this. and. Uh, uh, I look forward to do more tutorials with you, Jerry, in this area, perhaps uh, sharing uh, the technique in more detail down the line. Sure. Thanks Thank so you. much for joining me, Dr. Uh, uh, Jerry Semmerman, uh, the director of AGD Endo at Stony Brook University and in private practice at, uh, uh, in Long Island, New York. Uh, and for Rewild Endo, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this tutorial helpful.